Hang on one second. This was working earlier today. There we go. So can you see our name on the um, blackboard now? All yeah. right. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Great, thank you. So we're going to start off talking with the earliest work of our of our diorama um, career, and um, I started working making tabletop dioramas when I would had just left graduate school. I went to graduate school in Athens, Ohio, and I jumped in a few years after that. Uh, we had moved to Brooklyn, and it was 1999, mm -hmm. and Lori was working on this body of of work and I had nothing to do in the evenings and I asked if I could help with anything and she mm -hmm. said yeah sure and uh then I've been kind of roped in ever since yes. happily so and and these earliest works were about um my childhood spent in rural uh western Kansas and Kathleen had a similar um childhood experience growing up in uh, I grew up in uh, rural Illinois, uh, not quite as exciting as Lori's times with all the disasters and such, uh, but definitely very tied to the landscape and, and, and weather, um, which is still a big topic of conversation. Yeah, so my childhood was defined by whatever seasonal disaster was coming through, either be it um, tornadoes or blizzards or uh, insect infestations in the summer, lots of grasshoppers and June bugs and um, all kinds of nasties. <laughs> and, and these kind of childhood experiences is really what informed this earliest work because as a child, these things were exciting. They, they helped mark the passage of time because it was one exciting event after another. Um, and that's how I kind of remember my childhood based on the seasonal um, changes. Um, th that very um, basic diorama work led to this series that Kathleen and I started in 2005 called The City. And this is the body of work that most people are, are familiar with. And we were taking inspiration from living in New York City, living in Brooklyn and just being surrounded by all this amazing architecture, history. And we wanted to uh, recreate some of these spaces in miniature. Um, uh, God, what else? I said the other big thing about this, this body of work was accidentally Kansas was all exterior. Um, the like, it was one very specific, uh, focal point and then everything else blurred out. Right. This, um, Lori had started working at a photo lab and so I had the ability to print really large prints. So we took advantage of that. She was shooting with the eight by 10 camera. And so her negatives were just massive. And so we started putting a lot more detail into these because we knew that we would print them large and we kind of wanted to make it worth everyone's while to really spend some time with them. And there, you know, these are images of a post-apocalyptic city, not necessarily just New York. It's like strewn out all across the United States. Um, this is anatomy classroom. And when Kathleen and I decide to uh, do, these, do these images, we divide the work according to our skills. I'm more of the architect and she's more of the sculptor, sculpture. So I'm in charge of making these chairs, the cabinets, the floor, the walls, the windows, the ceiling. And Kathleen comes in and does what really makes these things sing. She does all of the small scale um, detail work. So yeah, so Lori would usually come up with the ideas. We would sit down, do some really rough sketches just so I would have a better understanding of where the camera was gonna be and just, we would sort of, like she said, divvy up the work that way. And I would just start right in on a lot of the detail. Um, we would always design mainly for just one viewpoint. It was never make the scene and then move the camera to see what looked best. You always had like a real strong idea of what the, what the area of focus was gonna be mm -hmm. and, and the sort of angle at it. And as we're thinking about these, we're thinking about three things what's the disaster that we're hinting at, um, the color, the overall color of the image, because these are going to be hung on the wall with all these other images. And if I, you know, if I was to just be left on my own, I would re keep using the same color palette. I like the, I like a nice olive green kind of drab colors, but we, we wanted to really think about 
different colors melding together in the gallery setting. And then um, the third, what was our third thing we usually think about? I forgot. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the fun things about this scene is that it was actually started out much, much wider. There's like a whole staircase off on the right, which just didn't make sense once we got it um, set up. But we do try to add a lot of little details just to make it kind of fun for us. So um, there's some uh, strawberries uh, in the vitrines over on the side. If you ever grew up watching Land, Land of the Lost, that Saturday morning TV show where they had the giant strawberries, it was like a great find for them. And then, I don't know, I thought it was hilarious, maybe not, that we had the pter pterodactyl up there. Like, it's obviously not part of the museum, so, but is it just like part of that sky? And so we would try to throw in some sort of oddball things here just to kind of throw people off a little bit. Because these scenes take anywhere from three months to 15 months to build and to fabricate. And the, the average is seven. And we're making these in our apartment in the middle of the living room. And so, um, you know, we're staring at these for seven months. We're having, we're having dinner with them. We're watching TV with them. So we also need to have a little bit of fun with uh, what we're doing because these do get a little tedious. And in this particular scene called Vacuum Showroom, we were really thinking of like Miami, Florida. So it's, it's hot, it's humid, it's, it's floral. And, you know, it's also a place with a lot of old people and what old people like to do, well, vacuum. But I'm making assumptions because I don't think my mom likes to vacuum much anymore. But the fun here for us was the, the posters that are on the wall and they're all about advertising for vacuums, but they're very specific to some art historical references. Uh, one of the very first posters called It's Classic. It's, it's, it's your... Um, is it Da Vinci? It's a, it's a Michelangelo. Sistine, Sistine Chapel of the like hand of God and like touching Jesus. Like, yeah. yeah. And then the next one is Magritte, where it's 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 raining vacuum cleaners. Um, the third one down uh, is uh, Starry Night Van, Van Gogh, and you have the vacuum sucking up all of the stars. And then down on the ground. Um, my favorite one was the uh, Duchamp uh, vacuum descending a staircase so but I didn't plan so well I ran out of wall so that particular poster is laying on its side on the ground and the whole time that Kathleen is making these I'm just like laughing just laughing myself silly Um, you know, we take our references from some of the places that we visit. This would be um, kind of like loosely based on Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. And other ones we just bring up off the top of our, off the top of our um, heads. But uh, we, we, again, we have as much fun as possible when we're sculpting these. So I think our floor here was based on some uh, famous floor where they have a mosaic tile. So this we just sort of glued down all these little fish and then uh, I sort of came in and then added a lot of the low relief uh, animals there on the side and then up along the top. I think there's a Loch Ness monster up there. Giant squid. Giant squid, horseshoe crab. Uh, just a lot of things that we find creepy and interesting. <laughs> creepy and interesting. <laughs> this is probably our, our most popular image we've done. It's, it's library. Um, when we're building these, we try to hand make as much as possible everything that you see, but there's always one object that we don't necessarily want to make. So we source it usually at a, a dollhouse or a toy store. And here we found the globe because we didn't really want to like put our, like make our heads figure out how to like take a flattened shape and make it into like the map and like make it into a globe, even though I know you could do it based on the internet. But again, we just took a shortcut because we're already like five months into this thing. So we bought the globe and then scaled all the rest of the scene around it. Um, it took me an entire summer to make all of these books 
and they're really just uh, they're made out of that construction foam that you can that you can come across at Home Depot or Lowe's. It's usually pink or blue or purple. So it's just little pieces of foam that I've carefully sanded the, the spines of the book, and then we painted each book, and then added some gold leaf on some of them. So there's like lots and lots of details. So while I, I'm making the book, Kathleen is um, making the tree and the animals. So like everyone or a lot of people want to know like where is this library and you know is it based on some specific place and we we don't really do that uh when she had the idea for the library uh we kind of went to the internet and just started looking at, at different spaces a lot of european and uh libraries and, and other sort of older older countries and this one, what captured our imagination was the sort of stair step out towards towards the uh, camera. We just kind of like how it, it led your eye towards the towards the center. Uh, so that was the one thing that we sort of started with, and then from there we sort of figured it out as we went along. Yeah, because this library was originally going to be white walls, but um, nah, didn't work. Didn't work. We like this uh, olive green, which again is one of my favorite colors. Sometimes we take inspiration from history. Uh, when we were thinking about doing this, we were thinking about old Pennsylvania train station, old Penn Station that they, they tore down in New York City. It was a, a marvelous piece of architecture that they chose not to save and they put up this horrendous basketball arena instead. And people are still complaining about it to this day. So I'm kind of imagining this as a, as a grandiose train station with these, with these uh, a uh, fountain of horses in the middle. And um, because people have left or people are no longer here, the fountain has been left on and it's frozen over into uh, a, a giant mound of ice. But you, there's still evidence of people had lived here at one point because there are trash bags, there's um, some mattresses or shopping, shopping carts. Um, and I don't think that we thought about it right at the start, but you could easily read into it like the the four horses of the of apocalypse. And it's just, you know, just sort of those ideas just seem to keep coming to the fore, forefront. So we just keep running with it. Because I'm kind of a, addicted to danger and disaster. It's kind of um, defined my life and how I think about things in a pot in a happy way. <laughs> Uh, this scene was was quite large and it also confused our cats because we have two indoor cats when we were making this and most of these plants are either plastic or paper or, or dead plants that were laying around the apartment and all of this we just put into this into this giant scene and we'd come home from our day jobs and find one of our cats just like sitting in the middle of this. I think she was confused and thought she was back in nature when in fact she was just in this like little toxic environment of plastic. So yeah. yeah. And uh, again, adding a little bit of humor in your um, lower in the image, you have some frogs that are like sitting in this water and there's like one frog in, this, in, the, in the far right corner that's he's staring at you and you're staring back at him. So there is this like um, view that like the frog knows that you are the viewer and is, and is acknowledging your presence. Uh, so we lived right on a, a subway line in, in Brooklyn that was this, this sort of orange, orange colored line. And uh, we rode the subway every day for, for a year. So it was probably kind of inevitable that we ended up making one. Yeah. Uh, this scene, uh, this, this model for this ended up being about eight feet long and about two feet high, two feet wide. Um, I could actually fit inside of it. And it's, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just, we were thinking about, originally we were going for the sort of walking, was it walking sand dunes mm -hmm. of Namibia? But that just didn't translate. So it ended up just being more of like, it's been beached somewhere. <laughs> Uh, the only thing that's missing in this scene is the actual smell of a of a New York City subway car. So thank God you're not smelling that. <laughs> this is one of our smaller, more intimate scenes. When we're doing these, we're usually working on two scenes at the same time. We're working on something really big in the living room, and then a smaller scene that might be in the in the back room. 
And I believe this one is about 18 inches wide and probably 20 inches deep. So it's relatively small and intimate. Um, everything here was fabricated by us except for the little bit of cactus that you see in the back corner. Uh, I was able to source these really amazing fluorescent lights that were in the perfect scale. And that's what set the scale for everything around that you see. And um, uh, because I like the fluorescent lights so much, I just had to do a nighttime scene because I've done, I've, I've spent way too many um, Friday and Saturday nights at the local laundromat doing my, doing my laundry and just feeling really sorry for myself. And um, because we were living in New York at the time, uh, there are actually more rats in New York than there are humans. So of course we had to throw a couple of rats in our, in our scene just to give it some, some life. So Kathleen uh, sculpted these guys. Uh, you can barely see the other one, but there's, there is one standing up underneath the dryers and his eyes are glowing a little, a little white dots, kind of like how when you are driving at night and an animal crosses into your path, either a deer or a raccoon, and you can see the, the whites of their eyes reflecting back out. So our, our little rat is doing the same thing. He's looking at you and you're looking at him. Uh, this is the only uh, one that we made where the, the space is not what it was originally designed for. Uh, we saw this as a church that had lost its purpose, had been turned into like a sign shop or some sort of storage. Um, I love this piece. I think Lori nailed the lighting of it. I think it's, it's very realistic as being daylight. And here, I think we played a lot with the idea of, of signs and religious signs. So there's lots of arrows up, down. Um, there's a no waiting there on the uh, bowling lane. And it's just, you know, we also sort of threw in a few just like personal things. There's a G for my last name. There's L for, for Lori. There's a big ear of, ear of corn. There's the apple. Um, so just a lot of fun things that we tossed in there. Yeah, yeah. This is probably one of our creepier images. It, it's, if you think of it as a, a nuclear power control plant that's um, had been abandoned, now it's flooded and everything is just so toxic. It, it's just uh, rusting away. And um, this is actually one of my favorite images. We created these, all this um, electronics out of uh, little googly eyes, those little plastic lenses because we needed to make this look like as industrial as possible. But when you think about the materials, it's like the backs of earrings, these googly eyes, some necklace parts for the rings around the, the, what am I, the lenses. The gauges. And yeah, and um, jewels to make it, things um, glow and pop and some wire. Um, yeah, again, this is this is one of the smaller smaller sets where uh, Lori sort of built it all all out, and then I I worked on it, um, doing a lot of the aging for it, and uh, it's it's kind of weirdly one of our favorites, I think, and very popular in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now I had to do a lot of research for to make this bar. You know, we had to go to a lot of bars just to see if we could get the right feel. And what's interesting about this is how much the camera is kind of distorting the scale. We scaled that pool table twice and we made sure we went on the internet and, and got the dimensions and Kathleen made it to scale, but somehow it just didn't quite translate. So we we're thinking of it more as like a little snooker table. Um, we're also um, a little scared of being sued by corporations if we should use their logos in any of this work. So for all the liquor bottles, we used vintage postage stamps. We figured the US Post Office probably has better things to do than to come after us for using postage stamps as, as liquor bottles. But that was our, our solution to, to, to this particular problem. Well, because along those lines, one of the issues that comes up with, with miniatures is being able to have things of very high, high quality at such a small scale. And so stamps, where they do very refined printing, seem to be uh, the best choice that we could come up with to um, do the intricacies of, say, labels and um, some of the adver advertising pieces. 
Now this scene is in particular really harks back to my childhood in a small rural western town. Uh, my mom used to take me to the beauty shop every week uh, when I was a, a small child so she could have her hair set and frosted and you know I was just enamored of this little tiny beauty shop. So this isn't about the city this is more um, small town America. And normally whenever we are finished with a scene, we sort of save out whatever we think we can re reuse or if we really like some of the handmade elements, we will keep those out. And then we take the scene apart and sort of cut it up so we can fit it into garbage bags and then, and then take it out. This is the only one that we have left intact because it's, it's very, very small. Uh, relatively, yeah, it's about 18 by 20 by 15 or so. Mm -hmm. And so we actually have a nice little crate for it. It will occasionally go out to museums or such if they're uh, doing kind of an educational show and they want to show models along with the photo photographs. Um, but this was a, a big success, I think. Yeah. We get a lot of flack for not keeping all of these scenes. Like people think that we should keep them intact and preserve them. But if you live in a small apartment, particularly in Brooklyn, you can't hold on to these. I counted and I think we have done what, 90 images? Something like that. That's a lot of, that's a lot of hoarding if you really wanted to keep <laughs> these things intact. So we well, don't. Well, and they were built to make the photograph. The like photograph was always going to be the like final, final, final piece of the puzzle. And actually, if you if you look at the models um, versus the photograph, photograph is much much better because the way that the light and what happens through the lens it just really makes it sing. And the models are nice and they're they're interesting, but it's just it's just not the same. Yeah. So this one's map room, and this was 15 months in the making. Um, each of these maps was uh, drawn and painted by Kathleen and um, just, it was a definite labor, labor of love. This is one of the largest <laughs> dioramas. This is one of the largest dioramas that we did. And this is based on a mall I used to go to uh, in Columbus, Ohio. And um, it was raised, so I never got to go back to actually see it before Here's we a, commenced oh, building this, it. even though I wanted to. So um, um, it was this is about nine feet it wide. No. Every page. So, well, there's enough. We're getting a little feedback from someone yeah. here. Yeah. So uh, this is a 10 feet wide, nine feet deep. So it's one of the largest ones we did because it really is a three-story mall. And um, it's kind of, I hate to even use this word, but it's, it's dollhouse scale. So a figure standing in here would be five inches tall six inches tall, depending on how tall you are. Uh, violin repair shop. This is the only one or one of two where it's actually based on a real a real space. We want to do some sort of very sort of craftsman uh, looking space, just lucked into being able to go to an actual shop. And it was great seeing all of the tools and getting a firsthand look. The bad side of it was once we saw this very specific space and it was beautiful, we just couldn't envision it any other way. So this is almost a, a perfect replica of this space in Manhattan for like high-end uh, violin repair. Yeah, and here all of the disaster is on the uh, is through the windows. You don't get a sense of this is an abandoned city until you look outside and you see the buildings across the street. <laughs> uh, we decided to do another stab at a library. This is called a uh, circulation desk. And uh, the most fun we had here was making the, the card catalog over on the far left hand of the scene. And you know, you ask young people what that is and they have no idea when, uh, you know, this is what we grow up. Uh, thumbing through in high school and college looking for our books. So um, we do have, we do enjoy playing with time and showing our age as we're, as we're working on these. Yeah, it's kind of a litmus test for who you're around if they know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Shoe store. You wouldn't believe it, but there are over a hundred tennis shoes in this scene. You know, we just keep making them and the scene just, uh, you know, you just need to keep making more and more and more to really fill out 
fill out the scene. And what's amazing about um, shoe stores in any major city is um, if there happens to be a blackout, which we experienced in 2004 or a tornado or whatever, uh, um, tennis shoe stores, shoe stores are the very first uh, businesses usually to be, to be robbed because uh, they're, the shoes are so highly coveted by a, a younger generation, so. Oh. Yeah, it, I have a love hate with this one. It's uh, I hated the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> she hated the shoes because she's the one who uh, who um, made them, and they and they don't have um, shoelaces. So these are futuristic shoes that just pull onto your feet, which are I think it's a thing now. It's a thing now. Yeah. This is the second piece. This is uh, the other one that was based directly on uh, a real space. It was around the corner from where we lived in in Brooklyn. Uh, our local Chinese uh, uh, restaurant uh, normally looked better than this, but this is the exact layout down to the bulletproof glass at the end. Um, what was sort of a, a fun part of this is all of the um, all the food up on the menu we actually made in miniature first. Uh, then Lori very carefully tried to re recreate that beautiful photography of that and then made the larger boards and then uh, lit them. And uh, I don't know, just sort of made it a, a little more personal to our experience as one of the favorites of our neighborhood was um, uh, like chicken and French fries, I think. Chicken with hot sauce and yeah, French fries. Not the, not the normal Chinese. Uh, yeah. and, you, and you may ask like, why didn't we just buy the Chinese food and plate it and photograph it? Well, Kathleen happens to be gluten free and um, Chinese food is rife with gluten. So uh, it's just easier to make it out of polymer clay. So this is an exact replica of our living room. So this is how our studio looked all the time. It looks actually a little more cramped than this because what you're missing is the wall, which is where the camera is. Um, and when we were making the living room, we were also working on the uh, subway uh, diorama at the same time. So then we had to shrink it down and make an ultra small diorama. And when we are making these, we try to make these things look as real as possible. So much so that every single CD that I had in my collection is represented on that shelf. I made sure and went through to make it and, 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 and yeah, wrote down everything that was there. Also the books that you see on the shelves I grabbed them off the shelf. I ran back to the office. I would flatbed scan the covers and size it in such a way. And then I would take the book and put it right back where it was. So this is exactly how the apartment looked. The only thing that she got wrong was on the flat files, there should be five drawers instead of four. <laughs> But those things still open. She was manic about them being functional. able to open and functional, <laughs> even though there's nothing in them. Yes. So <laughs> the old, the whole idea of us, and, and we can even talk about what happened today. We sent a a, um, a rover back up to Mars to explore uh, another um, uh, crater in Mars, and I think this is just phenomenal. How we're so interested in figuring out life on other planets because i think in the back of our mind we know that we're going to be having to leave this earth and search for new homes because we're not treating this one so well as we all know with um what we're all experiencing these last couple of weeks with 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 climate change these these crazy harsh winters and these incredibly hot summers and 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 fires and and droughts so this observatory is, a, is an old telescope looking towards the heavens, you know, and here we are in search of, of, of new, new frontiers to explore. And um, so here's this that push pull of, of time, of vintage, of new exploration. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think that's, my, I mean, I don't know how, I don't have my watch. I don't know how far we're going. I can show you a few more from the body of work that uh, we did after the city. We, we decided to go outside and get some fresh air rather than stay inside and making interiors. So we bought, we, we started this body of work and it, it really is looking at, at, at landscapes. 
And we are, we look at a lot of um, traditional painting, a lot of traditional landscape painting. So that was, and we wanted these amazing tumultuous skies to kind of like um, inform some of these landscapes. Yeah, we've always looked at a lot of the uh, like Hudson River School and just that whole notion of um, the new frontier, what's out there waiting, waiting for you, what is it, Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny. And then coupling that with the idea of like empire and how things are so cyclical that em empires rise, they're on top for a while and then inevitably they just have to fall off just because life is such a cycle. And, you know, start thinking about that with the United States and just some of the powers that be now and just sort of, look, so stepping outside, we kind of went back to look at these urban urban spaces, urban urban areas that are not at the top of the game anymore. Yeah. And so we, yeah, we created these cityscapes and some landscapes thinking specifically about that, about how cities will age and start falling apart if, if, if humanity is not there to take care of them. Um, sinkholes were happening all over uh, New York City the time that we spent there, and they're still happening all across the United States as we, as we frack, as as tectonic plate shift is just the natural cycle of of life. And we're not necessarily all that political, but sometimes we we do get a little political vibe. Um, here, I just remember reading a, a story uh, early on in the. Um, Trump presidency, where they were actually thinking of oil and uh, oil and gas mining in our in our natural uh, national parks, and you know, Americans, and I would think almost just any country, we're so interested in in the fast dollar and in the quick money that we don't think about time, and um, so we decided to play with that notion where, you know, if if it was possible to make money in these in our natural resources, we would of course leave the things that people love the most. They get photographed, but then uh, strip away everything, all the surroundings around them. So along along with that, we were uh, looking at um, in China they were having the phenomena of the uh, nail house nail nail houses. So it was these holdout people who would not give in to developers, they would just stay put. And so they would do everything around these little homes. And so they would stick out like there was like a nail sticking out of the, out of the floor. Um, so that's kind of how we chose to save these um, monuments, <laughs> the mittens. The mittens. I'm just fascinated by infrastructure and highways and just how they crisscross the United States and just the, the, the engineering marvels that are, are around me. So I just felt compelled to create my own uh, super highway. And so everything up to this point was all practical camera work, um, no digital manipulation with it. With this series, uh, we went digital. Uh, Lori plugged in, if you will. <laughs> and um, it really changed how we ended up working because it wasn't so much about counting how many sheets of film that were going into it. We, knowing that it was just our time, um, we were we felt more compelled to actually move the camera around, switch things around. So for a lot of this series, we actually did them two or three times even. Yeah. Either by changing the whole set itself or just changing the point of view of it. And then it also changed how she ended up photographing them. You wanna talk about that? Oh yeah, so in order for us to make, so these prints are large. These can be printed f like four feet by six feet if, um, if need be. And the way that we captured these digitally is that we would you know, photograph these one square at a time in a giant grid. And we'd also photograph them front to back. So you're shooting one, one, one corner, shooting it front to back, you move the camera, do the same thing. So I believe in order for us to create this image, it was over, um, 3,500 images to computer for it to all um, process and, and come together because these are still like really large depths of depth of field, which is something that was really hard to achieve with the eight by 10 camera because you're limited by your lens. But here the technology just kind of 
opened up and allowed us to have much more flexibility. But because we're shooting, you wouldn't believe it, but because we're shooting digitally, I actually was even more particular about how these images were being shot. So I would shoot these again and again and again. This one took eight hours to photograph, um, all said and done. And um, just, just wanting everything to be so perfect because I'm still not a computer person. I'm not a Photoshop person. So trying to get things just right uh, from, from the get go. Uh, this one, so Lori's also had a big love affair with brutalist arch architecture for a long, long time. Uh, this is one where we, we set the whole scene up totally different. Again, we were trying to work with sand again and had big waves of, of sand, was not working at all, cleared everything out, cleaned everything off, and then just reset everything. Basically got the camera down in there a lot, a lot tighter, brought some greenery in, built the scaffolding. And it's just a completely different photograph. Yeah. Um, we actually have a small book published called Pass Fail, where we show the failures of each of these images leading up to what we consider the final. So um, it's the first time that, like with the, when we're shooting the 8x10 camera, um, it was what it was. And with the digital, we get to change as much as we want. And we took great advantage of that as we were working. Uh, this one was, uh, we were living opposite Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And so this is based on a general area over there. And I uh, can't remember how we came up with the little trailer I idea, uh, but this was, um, I don't know, I think it's one of our most successful scenes. Again, I think for me, it really boils down to the quality of light. And then I'm just really happy with how the trees turned out. And so. these are a combination of real trees and um, trees that we made out of epoxy and wire. So there's a combination of the two and hopefully you can't tell the difference between the two. Because mm -hmm. again, we're striving for reality. And again, this was one where we uh, built it as, as is. And then initially it was just all of the greenery and everything still there, but it was, it was, it was, too homogenous in terms of the land it your eye didn't really know where to settle so we went ahead shot that image knew that we had that and then Lori came in and sprinkled some snow and I think it made it a much more successful piece yeah and these are just a couple of, of quick scenes of like what it looks like in the studio Kathleen actually uh, built this telescope and it's a combination of earrings, PVC pipes, uh, microscope lenses for the eyepieces for the um, telescope, uh, beads, a little bit of everything. Uh, a little bit blurry, but a little um, uh, drill press that is carved out of foam. They're the ubiquitous um, chicken wings with hot sauce and french fries. So small plates of food that she made out of polymer clay. And this is what our studio typically looks like is a complete disaster at all times. And what I'm doing here is I'm mixing paint so that she could paint a wall uh, to look like that photograph like laying there on the table. So that's my color reference for her. So if you were to like look at the, the like calendar of work for the studio, we probably build models for 11 months out of the year. And then you photograph for a month, maybe. No, like three weeks. <laughs> three weeks. Yeah. So it is, it's, I don't know, it's a unorthodox way to work, um, but I, I don't know how else we'd get what we, what we want. Yeah, because if I was to like go out with the camera and just shoot on the street, oh, not good. I am not a street shooter. I just don't have it in me. I don't see the way most people or other people see. So I much prefer to create the scenes that I want to photograph rather than go in search of them. So here's Kathleen inside the uh, inside the subway, just just enough for her to climb in there. And this is where we're shooting digitally, um, one of the scenes, so you can get a kind of a sense of the setup. And when we can, we use uh, as natural elements as possible. Um, and because it does take a little bit, it takes a while to photograph these uh, plants, kind of get a little moldy. Water gets a little gross. We add a little bit more as we go along. 
Do you want to talk about your skies at all? Or how do you do your skies? Oh, these are just large. Well, I don't do it all the time. But if for this one, it was a large it was a, I, I, I took the, this amazing sky uh, when I was in um, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and had a really large print put up behind the wall. Um, because I, I'm old fashioned, I actually want to see the scene as, as best I can, so, but through the lens. Uh, there's a couple of other images where I've dropped the sky in later, but I try not to do that as much. Because again, I want to see, I want to be able to compose in the lens as, as I'm working. Uh, Kathleen is just an amazing sculptor, I think. Hmm. And here she is. Uh, oh. This was part of the, the mower that was in concession. Um, so you get a kind of a sense of the scale that we work at sometimes. And that, that scale varies. It, as she says, it's often based on one or two particular items for each scene. Um, also just kind of a scale that, that feels um, comfortable, which is probably like GI Joe scale something like that. Yeah. And here she is inside that mall, the, the one of the larger scenes that we've ever done. So she's like st sitting in the middle of it, um, just adding more detail with paint and what have you. So even though we work in miniature, they're not necessarily miniature that most people think. They're, they're, the scenes still get really large as we work on them. They just like, grow exponentially. And so again, this is why we don't save them. Because uh, the other part is they're not nice, tight, little constructed pieces. It's like a lot of these are just sort of tacked in place. That whole roof is just setting on top of those walls. So it would not be easy to just store it. We'd have to take it all apart and wrap everything up. So it wouldn't be how people imagine it, I think. Yeah. And sometimes we have, we have our, um our critters uh, <laughs> that like to hang out in our scenes. This is our cat Merman. <laughs> and we, she, we consider her the quality control agent. She's always like hanging out, making sure that we're, we're making good work as we, as we go. She's tough. And it's the details that really matter. Even when we're working on scenes, it comes down to, you know, gum on the sidewalk. Little tiny lungs. And it took me three, three days to install all the books for this particular library scene. So they are um, labor intensive. And I believe that's it. All right. Very, very nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Oh, I hope people have some questions for us. Yeah, I certainly hope so. All right. Yeah. Come on, anybody out there have a question? I have a, I have a question, if I may. Okay. Um, you talked about like the pool table and certain things and getting things to scale. How do you decide which item comes first? Because every once in a while you would say, oh, this, you know, every, everything was built off the fluorescent lights. Um, how do you determine what's your starting point? Well, it's usually how how hard something is going to be, um, or just you know I don't know how we would, for instance, for those for those lights, how we would recreate that. So being able to find that uh, precise of a thing at just the right size that would actually put out light. Yes, we could have done a um, like a, a clear tube and sanded it so it might glow a little but it wasn't going to really shine so um based on the initial idea for what we want the scene to look like we try to figure out what are the main things that we that we really want to have happen in it um, the other thing is some things are just so detailed we just couldn't make it better if we were trying to make it by hand so those two things are the deciding factor probably yeah oh, I just want to say, great sense of humor. I, I really like it. You guys Thank are fun. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm, I'm Nancy. I hey, Nancy. Lot, Hi. I do a lot of photography in abandoned buildings. And uh, it's kind of the romance of the things decomposing. Uh, it's, it's quite 
quite an experience. And oh, when yeah. I saw the promotion for this event, I thought these were actual abandoned buildings. I had no idea you <laughs> were into all this labor of uh, and the artistry of the little diorama. So I am so impressed. Oh, <laughs> no. thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, I love abandoned buildings. I would love to explore them. I'm just like terrified of going in there and falling through a floor or, or what have you. So, yeah. Yeah. It happened. I'll, I'll stay in my, I'll stay in my apartment where it's a little safer. <laughs> <laughs> I came in, this is Susanna. Um, I came in about halfway through, so I missed the first half. And I've got two questions. Are these on exhibit anywhere? And if not the dioramas, the photographs? Um, we've had exhibitions of these. Um, the series lasted from 2005 to 2015. Mm -hmm. So they've been in exhibitions. We've had a couple of shows, but now the work is considered old. So I don't really foresee any um shows coming up that i know of i mean there's a piece here and a piece there but not an entire museum show which is unfortunate because that would be really cool i think we've only had two museum shows where we got to show the entire body of work so it's a it's a rare occasion that, yeah. um oh. so if you know any museums that need any shows <laughs> we're ready to go <laughs> what about the greenville county art museum i don't know i mean well, um, I think well, yeah, it's like we can't go to the museum and ask for a show. They have to come to us. And mm -hmm. most museums have their schedules yeah. figured out three to five years in advance. So um, and with COVID, yeah, I think they're a little backed up for shows. Yeah. But if any of you guys know anyone, you know, please turn them on to our work. <laughs> All packed up and ready to go. That's right. <laughs> Michael, you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm back up a couple of years too. <laughs> See? Yeah. So he knows. He knows what it's all about. Yeah, because we've done nothing this year. We've had to push out this year or last year into later this year and next year. Yeah. Mm. Uh, are, are your art prints available anywhere? They are. We have we have gallery representation in New York and um, Seattle. Um, you can email us laurinix.net if you just googled us and I could like sh point you to the right place that would sell you some prints. Yeah. Yeah. But these days I'd be surprised if our work sells because because they are of, of, of disaster and the apocalypse. And it seems like we're living in the middle of one right now. So I can't imagine anyone would want to look at these when life is just like what you see in the photograph. So um, yeah, we need to make some happier work. Yeah. <laughs> it's not gonna be easy. <laughs> we're, not, we're not geared towards that. <laughs> you have your prints uh, addition at all. You mentioned earlier that you are able to, you know, you're shooting with an eight by 10 or, or you've got, you know, thousands of images to create uh, the digital file. And so you can print up to, you know, four by six feet or something. Mm -hmm. It kind of sounded like, you know, if you want to print, tell me the size. <laughs> how, you know, how, how do you swing all that? How do you swing that? Um, we'd make an addition. Each image is addition in a very small edition of 15 prints and three artist proofs. So they're quite limited in their availability. And, uh, and it's the pressure of the galleries. You know, some photographers want to make really large editions of 100 or 300, but um, the galleries that we work with, they want to have this unique um, kind of um, rare edition. So 15 prints is, is all we get to do. Yeah. And so when you the sizes. Oh, and the sizes are like 30 by 40 inches. It's considered small. 40 by 50 is medium and 48 by whatever. It'd be considered a large print. So they're, they're large prints. Yeah. So three sizes and, and, and 15 only, whatever, whatever is needed for whatever you're printing it. Yep. And yep. You just kind of let, let either the gallery or the, or the buyer dictate the size. 
Well, we, 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 we recommend three sizes, but I can also custom, you know, because if people have a, a collection, they only have so much space on their wall, I'm happy to make a custom size for them. So, yeah. I'd rather people have the work than not. So, yeah. Do you feel that the, you know, that you mentioned also that there's so much detail. Do you feel that there is a size that's too small for um, you guys have? No, and like some of the some of the the intimate spaces, like the beauty shop, really works best as a thirty by forty. It doesn't need to be any larger than that. Whereas um, map room or library, it literally looks good a lot larger. So whenever we have an exhibition, if it's an intimate space, we keep it we keep it small on the wall. Small being thirty by forty, and um, larger images get larger. Yeah. Anybody else out there? I have a, uh, just a comment. Uh, I, I uh, spent some time shooting ruins in Detroit a few years ago, and I was just amazed at how um, some of your uh, sets resemble uh, <laughs> places I had been. And um, I gotta say, it's, it's a luxury that you have to be able to do that work safely and <laughs> yeah. not get mugged or uh, beaten yeah. up by police or something like that. Um, but there are a lot of uh, schools, particularly the high schools, where the uh, remains of the library and the uh, cafeteria and all everything is just kind of being overtaken by nature and falling into the ground. And then there's the place where the uh, uh, old um, opera house has been turned into a parking ramp. Um, yeah. The, the, that's all pretty familiar to people, but uh, it's really cool that you could do um, do all that in, in miniature and um, it, uh, it, it gives you a lot of a, a lot more freedom to uh, work with your lighting and everything. And oh, yes. The, you know, yeah. nobody, no, nobody's going to walk into the scene or something when you're working on it. So anyway, I, uh, I really like your work. And oh, thank I'm, you. I'm impressed. I, I can't imagine the patience it would take to do that. I certainly don't have it. <laughs> thank God there's two of us to help to like work. Yeah. yeah. It does help. And, and, you know, I just wouldn't feel safe photographing in, in abandoned buildings. I just think it's a little too, a little too iffy these days. So more power to you that you guys, the two of you at least go and, and, and do that. And hopefully you're, you're doing it as a, as a team of two or three and not just totally on your own. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I really appreciate, well, we have those books about Detroit and about, beautiful. you know, abandoned mm -hmm. architecture. And that's what we use for reference on how paint should look and how, yeah, how cool. stains are on the wall. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> right. If there's nobody else, we'll wrap it up for this evening. I do want to thank everybody that came by. Um, next month on March 18th, we have Mitch Dobrowner. Nice. I'm looking forward to that. So until next month, we'll say good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank Thank wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Great work. Eat well. Nice. Thanks.